while we're waiting, um, maybe I'll mention next month's um, event. So uh, I'm Michelle Arnaud, Vice President of uh, Great Panthers NYC. And next month on February 28th, which also is our president's birthday, meaning <laughs> President Jack Kupferman, uh, we will be uh, hosting a, another Transformation Tuesday with Irving Stackpole and Michael Wasserman. And it has the very compelling title, Fragile, The Fragile Future for Aging Services, The Collision of Money, Politics, and Denial. So please put it on your calendars for Tuesday, February 28th. And at the same time, we'll sing happy birthday to Jack. That was good so yeah. um, we're up to about 40 people so far. I'll just give it like a couple more minutes and then we'll start. Rachel, hi. Hello, um, Jack. Hello, everybody. Alice, Alice hi. Um, Carmen, hi. Carol, we need to talk. Um, Charlie Navarrete, haven't spoken to you in some time. I'm really happy that you're joining us. Glad to be here. Thanks, Jack. How are you been? And you know, even though it's always a wonderful thing that I don't know everybody on the calls, I really want to learn, you know, we, we all want to learn who everybody is, but we're not going to do introductions. We just want to absorb. So, all right. And it's always good to have people who are not the usual suspects. So I guess we can kind of start right now. We're up to 42. We um, anticipate a lot more. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm Jack Kupferman, president of Great Panthers NYC. And as meant, most of uh, you know that we've been doing this webinar series for a year and a half or more. And they've become quite um, well attended and in their own influential. So um, one of the things that we're gonna be discussing today the, the, the niche that we've kind of laid that's evolved is, uh, as Sophia had indicated, is bringing people the awareness of what the hell's going on in nursing homes post COVID and generally. And we're using the, the COVID devastation as a springboard for change, for transformation. That's why they're Transformation Tuesdays. Michelle Arnaud was the brain behind the, um, this entire series and for which we're always eternally grateful. And we have a lot of stuff that's coming up on the, uh, on, that has been evolving from this, from this series. One of the things that's been most significant is that people here on these calls, they get the opportunity to connect with other advocates as well as to learn the details. And many of you here have been able to actually speak with or um, not only learn from, but to connect with others, whether they be the, the panelists or other uh, people on the, um, in the audience. So that is one of the values of what we're doing here. Now, what we're talking about here is, uh, would you, whoever it is, please mute yourself. Um, what, Ageism, that is the core of why nursing homes and the whole system really needs to be tossed out and start from scratch. For everyone, we have been talking about what are the problems? Why are, why are we in such a mess? Why, how do we make sure that older people and those, all people who are in long-term care facilities how do we transform them to um, the, not only that they're not, that they are no longer hospitals and that they are homes, which is the critical component, but how do we make sure that the care that they need and the attention that they need is properly 
uh, provided through staffing, through money, through environment, through attitude, through family connections, through a whole host of things. And so we know that ageism is the problem. However, we don't always reach the solutions. How do we do that? What needs to be done? Who's doing what? Not only the uh, ideas, but the specifics. That's why we're having this particular um, Transformation Tuesday, Solutions to Ageism in Nursing Homes. Our panelists are across the board. We have Annie Rhodes from the Virginia Commonwealth University who does great research on ageism and in the long-term care setting. She is a well-respected um, researcher and works in the gerontology department of VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University. And it is, she's a great find. Dee Cato is the um, CEO of AJ Rhodes Nursing Home System in Atlanta. There are three or four homes, nursing homes that he uh, runs. And one of the things about Deke is that he is one of the more progressive nursing home operators and administrators, meaning that he is on the cutting edge of change and understands what needs to be done from um, a practical and hands-on perspective. He's not, the, not only the theorists, theorist, he is the implementer and has a very clear understanding. Then, of course, we have Anne Montgomery, who's been doing her policy work for decades and is very familiar with how policy works with regard to aging services and particularly uh, nursing homes at the national level. She's worked uh, for uh, the, the House Sen Select Committee on Aging, as well as being doing a lot of um, consulting work. We are really thrilled that all, all of you have come to join us today, and we really can't wait to hear your innovative solutions. And I would like to start with Annie. Would you be so kind? Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, we love Gray Panthers down at Virginia Commonwealth University, and we make sure all of our students come through with an excellent respect for the Gray Panthers organization and uh, awareness and understanding of Miss Maggie Kuhn herself, so it's an honor to be here. Uh, and Virginia Commonwealth University at our Department of Gerontology, for those who don't know, we are one of the few departments and perhaps the only Department of Gerontology in the country that has both an ageism lab and a long-term care uh, reform lab. So this is an intersection of um, topics that we are very passionate about and that we do kind of cultivate and research quite frequently. And I will keep my remarks uh, as brief as, as possible, I am known to kind of go on my soapbox, but I want to start with a quote from the recent 2022 consensus report on the Committee of Care in Nursing Homes, and that is that the way in which the United States finances, delivers, and regulates care in nursing home settings is inefficient, ineffective, fragmented, and unsustainable, an immediate action to initiate fundamental change is necessary. Up and down, this system is broken. And I could not agree more with what Jack said, which is the root of all of this is ageism. And the fact that the comfort of people who are older, and especially people who are older who are disabled, is not valued and never has been valued in this country. And so up and down from the micro to the macro level, we need to be looking at solutions that encourage and uplift and demonstrate that every person is valuable and get rid of this ugliness, this ableist ageism ugliness that exists in the system. To be able to do that, 
Part of the reform is understanding that nursing homes have been designed in this way. It is not a bug of the system. It is a feature of the system. And I talk about this so that when we are talking at an individual level with nursing home administrators, or when we are advocating at a policy level, we are informed enough to be able to ask for um, where we need to go and be aware of where we have come from, okay? So systemic ageism in the nursing home, part of it comes from resource allocation, okay? And what we see is that nursing home resources from well before the pandemic, they have never been out or resources for older adults, resources for people who need them have never been allocated into a nursing home environment, right? They are allocated to children. They are allocated to um, other populations, but the last on the list is always older adults. And so when we are advocating, we need to make sure that older adults and facilities are getting their equitable piece of the pie. Uh, what we see a lot in a research context is that uh, older adults are diverted into institutional environments like nursing homes and younger adults with disabilities are diverted out of institutional environments like into a waiver program where they can have a CNA come to their home for four hours a day, for instance. The recommendations that geriatric or case managers or workers at the hospital, they are not equitable. A case manager is much more likely to recommend that an older adult go to a nursing home and a younger adult receive care at home. So not only are the resources distributed unequally, but the ageism that's demonstrated in our healthcare professionals perpetuates the uh, disproportionate placement of older adults into nursing homes. So that's where I'm gonna start, which is that we need training, not just for people who work and live in nursing homes about ages and, and ableism, but we need geriatrics and gerontological training for anybody interacting in the healthcare system. Every single person needs to know that there are widespread options for anybody for rehabilitative and long-term care, and that these need to be person-centered. The antidote for ageism in at the micro context is person-centered care, right? We see ageism and the symptoms of ageism and the, the problems of ageism happen when folks make assumptions about older adults and don't ask them what they want. So every single person needs training on older adults and person-centered care. Next. And this is much more uh, meso level and it's gonna be a lot harder to do. The biomedicalization of aging needs to stop. Aging is time, aging is life, aging is not a disease. Aging is what we are all doing as we pass through our lifespan together. And instead of helping older adults or younger adults or children or people who are middle-aged have the life and the outcomes and that they want, uh, regardless of ability or income or location or gender, we are putting assumptions on them and we pay a lot of money to treat what we think are diseases in the healthcare system. And age and getting old is not a disease. That is also why you see really good treatment for short stay, nursing home rehabilitative care with the big fancy rooms and the big TVs and lots of nurses and CNAs, and you get that for a hundred days. And then when you move into long-term care, things get a lot different and you get those rooms where six people are in a room and there's four people to a bathroom and there's no care, that's because this is the biomedicalization of aging and we're only looking to treat 
short term stays, but we are not taking care of the long term. So that needs to stop. And then all of this needs to happen through, uh, well, not all, all of it needs to happen through, again, this coming back to being aware and rooting out the internalized and externalized ageism and ableism and beginning to uplift and cherish and taking seriously the comfort and the well being and the wants and needs of older adults, younger adults, people of all ages, no matter where they live. That's going to need to happen by making choices that prioritize people over capitalization, which means that reimbursement rates are going to need to actually go toward taking care of the person and not toward the private equity firms. And that's going to need to happen by making sure that uh, folks have access to private rooms or to home care or any of number of evidence-informed solutions. So my call to action for all of you is to start by joining your local AARP in whatever state you're in. And when they send out a call to action, make sure you answer it. I talked to our AARP here in Virginia. They have a uh, Voices for Virginia Nursing Home Residents, and they're just trying to get a staffing bill passed. Um, Virginia is one of 19 states in this country that doesn't have a minimum uh, for staffing, staffing uh, minimum. And he said, I can't even get 30 people to make a phone call. I can't even get 30 people to make a phone call when we have a chance to make reform. Answer phone calls, answer calls to action. Follow when people, when your organizations that you that ask for help, when they ask you for help, respond. Also consistently and constantly be reflective in yourself for of course, ableism and ageism and call it out in other people when you see it. It can be gentle or it can be rough or however you need to do it, but call it out because that's how we get toward a less ableist and ageist society. And of course, vote and expect other people to vote. I wanna quote what I heard Sophia, she's the intern at Great Panthers who I just met. Uh, and I wanna quote something she said at the beginning of the call, which is, it's not enough to be angry, you have to act. And those are all easy ways we can start acting right now without need for special training or um, a age uh, ageism lab, these are all ways we can begin. And I will um, let my colleagues and uh, fellow panelists talk from there. Oh, you're on mute, Jack. I'm usually the one who says unmute. <laughs> Annie, I just want to say thank you so much for that very inspiring presentation and importantly with a call to action that has specifics and that makes sense. Um, the collaboration between VCU and Grey Panthers is just beginning. We got a lot of work to do. And as you can, as all of us can see on this call, on this Zoom, we all share the same mindset, everybody on this Zoom. Let's make change happen and let's transform to a better, what we should be doing. Our next uh, panelist, who is a man of many connections and just, I'm always, when I, when I speak of, when I think of Deke, how broad his imagination and practicality is. Um, I give a very br a brief um, introduction before, and I'd like to turn the opportunity over to Deke. Thank you very, very much, Jack. Um, you, you're kind of checking off my bucket list because I'm extremely proud to be here for Transformation Tuesday. Um, I seem to be on a call almost every other day with Jack. Um, there's a movement afoot right now, which, which I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about as well. Um, but a little more specifically, I run nursing homes. I'm the CEO of AG Roads, as introduced by Jack. Um, but even prior to that, you see the, the plaque on the wall 
is probably the qualification I am most proud of. I have been a nursing home administrator um, and directly ran nursing homes for over 20 years. Um, so I hope Jack calls me back on, on Transformation Tuesday because I think I'm going to be a little bit controversial. Thank you for that introduction to um, Clifton Perez. Um, I'm going to be a little bit controversial, I think, as a nursing home provider, because um, I'm going to talk a little bit from the perspective of a provider. Again, I've done this for over 27 years. Um, and what I've learned is you see one nursing home, you've seen one nursing home. So I think we paint nursing homes with far too broad a brush. Um, Annie, I agree with you totally. The system is broken, um, but I think we need to stop playing the the blame game with it being broken and, and, and just fix it, right? The system was designed this way. It was badly designed. Um, so the topic of ageism, and again, I agree with Annie. I don't think you could talk about ageism without talking about ableism as well. Um, you know, and that is, is because of someone's disability. Um, not only their age, we, 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 we make false um, decisions, false statements, false actions based on that. Um, but here's where the controversial part starts. Again, keep in mind, I've seen many, many nursing homes in this country, and I think there are a lot of isms in nursing homes that we need to fix just as much, or we will not be able to fix um, ageism either. So classism is a huge problem that we've created in our nursing homes. I, I describe nursing homes almost plantation-like, very hierarchical where we have the CNAs and the direct care caregivers on the bottom, bottom rung. And then we have our people like me who sit in the glass offices on the top, on the top rung. Um, racism in many, many of our nation's nursing homes, including some I have run, um, it, is, it is shocking um, that we do not have representation of people of color in higher um, levels in those nursing homes. So I just want to predicate it by that, that we have a lot of isms that we need to, to, to deal with in nursing homes. A little bit, again, my organization, um, we, we and, and a lot of this I'm telling you has come out of COVID as well. Um, we in our organization had about 307, 387 resident cases of COVID. Um, and we had about 30 residents, not about, we've had 30 resident deaths um, because of COVID. And I always like to start by giving those statistics because I think it should make us pause um, because it is sad that as a nation, we lost so many people um, due to COVID. And I do think the root of some of that um, is ageism, but I also remind people as a nursing home provider that um, COVID being an illness that affected so many of our elders, so many of our most vulnerable population, that it does not surprise me that nursing homes had that level of, of debt. Um, and because of a lot of the reasons you were told about earlier. Um, what unfortunately for me came out of, 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 of COVID and, and, and again is rooted in ageism is how a lot of our nation's elders were treated during COVID. Um, it pains me that we had to shut down nursing homes the way that we did. Um, it pains me that, that a lot of our elders could not see their family members before they passed. It pains me that a lot of, of elders did not see their family members for well over a year. And I wanted to read a little something to you. This is a very true story, but I'm going to read it so that I, I, I properly represent it. And it's something that I wrote. Um, Late that evening, I received a text from Joan and Andy Inneman. And Andy's mother, Rita Inneman, was a resident at our Wesley Woods home. She was a resident at my, one of my nursing homes. Her 94th birthday marked the first day of COVID visitation restrictions on March the 12th, 2020. Her birthday festivities were canceled just as the family reached the nursing home. After hearing the news about the, the so, so they came to visit their mom that day and they were unceremoniously told, hey, nursing homes have been cut down for visitation, so they were not able to visit her for her birthday. Um, they reached out to me a year later via text, and that was two days before her 95th birthday. Um, and all they wanted to do 
was visit with their mom, Miss Inamum. Nursing home regulations at that time did not allow the visitation um, because of, a, of something called a surplus, which I call a surplus of safety. Um, but I was able to make that visit happen on her 95th birthday. Um, so we arranged that visit. They were able to hug and to kiss Miss Inamon, I was there for the small party that they had. Again, this was all against regulation. Um, and they had a wonderful visit with Miss Inamon. Miss Inamon passed about two months later, not, not because of COVID. Um, and that family is forever grateful that they were able to see their mother before she passed. Um, and I speak specifically to COVID because I think we did a disjustice to our elders in some ways with how we shut down our nursing homes and with you know, some of these visitation requirements. A good friend of mine, Jill Orsiam, um, writes about it. She writes about what's called a surplus of safety in nursing homes. Um, a lot of this is rooted in ageism. A lot of this is rooted in us trying to dictate or tell someone because of the age what they can have to eat, what they can't have to eat, who can visit them, when they can be visited, when they can have a bath, when you know that is that is the reality of our nursing home structure and it i will say absolutely has to be changed um i'll also cite another good friend of mine um dr al power who writes in his, his book or wrote in his book dementia beyond disease um about infantilism and about the theory of retrogenesis which is where you know we say once a man and twice a child and these are all these are all thoughts rooted in ageism as well um, where we assume that people, because of their disability, have some sort of, of cognitive age. We measure their cognitive age, um, which is wrong as well, and which we need to address in our nursing homes as well. Um, the flip side of ageism that I think we also need to, to, to fix um, is, is related to our staff in nursing homes. Um, I think a lot of our, our policies and procedures regarding staff, regarding schedules um, is also rooted in ageism. Um, I, I have two daughters that are millennials and I could tell you right now, they probably will never work in a nursing home because we don't allow that flexibility of staffing because our benefit packages and everything are not designed for, for, for them. Um, so, you know, so that's two sides to, to, to that equation as well. Um, my huge call to action today, I saw, saw Alice Bonner texting in the group. My huge call to action today is there is a movement afoot. There's a movement to repair nursing homes. Um, there's a mo movement to fix that broken structure, which was pointed out in the NASM report earlier. Um, and Alice heads a group called Moving Forward that brings all sorts of advocates together um, for us to change, for us to, to, to recommend the changes that are needed in this are needed in our system, and those changes are many. So my call to action is is it was in the chat group. Research what that moving forward group is. Um, reach out, go online, reach out to members of that group, um, and let's advocate for that change that needs to come. Um, my other call of act to action is understand they are very bad providers in this country. I completely get it. But I'll end as I started. You've seen one provider, then you've seen one provider. They are not all bad. Um, all nursing homes aren't tied up in, 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 in the hands of billionaires and, or, and private equity. Um, you know, there are some of us that are really trying, like Jack said, to make a change, to make a difference. And most importantly, make it, making a difference for the most vulnerable of, among us, making a difference for people who are on Medicaid. Um, not, not just people who can pay privately for it, um, making a difference for not just people because of, 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 of by virtue of their age, but making a difference based on all the isms, the ageism, the ableism, the classism, the sexism, and the racism that exists in our nursing homes as well. Jack, with that, I'll hand it back over to you. Again, Deke, always fantastic your thoughtfulness and your insight and just, you know, you're bringing both multiple perspectives to this very complicated and important concept. One of the things that you're referencing is that aside from the fact that we all know that it's not easy, 
but there's so many different components to this. And basically, you reference that nobody really cares. Nobody really cares. That is in Yiddish, a shanda. You know, how dare this country, how dare this world not care about people like this? That's because being in a long-term care facility is on no one's bucket list. They don't care. So um, thank you so much for, and for your calls to action. Uh, let us next move on to Anne Montgomery. And can't wait to hear what you're going to have to say, no doubt. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. And again, um, congratulations to everybody who's an advocate. Uh, I'm sure that all of us on this call and this webinar are advocates. And I guess that that is a very hopeful sign, I would say, uh, for trying to grapple with and, and defeat ageism. It requires energy. It requires a movement. And it requires specific actions to change the prevailing paradigm which I think um, both Annie and Deke gave great uh, voice to. There are so many things that are, that are wrong um, with the current paradigm of nursing homes. And we think about, when we think about how they were designed, they really were designed as kind of a segregation device. Okay, all the sick old people go over here where we don't have to see them. We don't have to know very much about them. And uh, they should, if they don't have families to take care of them, sort of count themselves lucky to get anything, <laughs> to get a decent bed, food, care, et cetera. That's an, obviously an, an awful uh, paradigm that we need to change. So how can we change it? Well, uh, you can become an advocate in, and of your, in your own right, uh, wherever you are. You can speak up uh, at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level. And I've spent my life, uh, a good portion of it, uh, trying to speak up at the national level. I live in Washington, D.C., as well as Virginia. Um, my mother had multiple sclerosis uh, that she acquired in her early 40s, really devastated her, although she did live for 25 years um, with chronic progressive MS. And I watched that journey. I was then in college when she was uh, first diagnosed. And I noticed right away that although she had gold-plated health insurance, the best you can get, she really didn't have access to public coverage, to the common you know, coverage for what she needed, um, which was all those supports and services that we don't cover in our healthcare programs and that we don't value enough in other programs to put serious money toward. What we do have is a medical industrial complex and that is pretty much what most nursing homes represent today. Not all, as Deke always reminds us and, and very rightly so, there are many good nursing homes, but I would say that the majority are very medically oriented, kind of step down hospital style, uh, where frankly, nobody wants to live. And this is not surprising. Consumers have been telling us this for decades. And it's a bit accidental that they came to be built and designed the way that they stand today. Can we change that? Absolutely. Um, how do we change that? That's where it gets interesting. And the policy and politics around that are, are a bit ferocious. Uh, it is true that private equity isn't the only game in town. Uh, there are many great nonprofit providers and other kinds of providers, but there is this kind of tendency uh, to you know, look to the status quo and to keep replicating that. Uh, as I say, kind of long you know, corridors, hospital-like conditions, no attention you know, to the quality of life. And when people come to nursing homes, they aren't there to just receive services. They aren't inert, you know, people in beds that need occasional tending. They go there to live, <laughs> however long they live, usually several years on average. And they have every right to have as interesting a life in that nursing home as if they were living elsewhere, you know, in their own home or some other setting. But we do not prioritize that. But we can and we can start by uh, changing some of the other isms uh, uh, in the staff uh, realm, for example. We don't train people very adequately. Uh, we give them at the federal level, there's only a 75 hour requirement for certified nurse aides to get training. 
And often that's the first two weeks on the job. It's not really a thoughtful training. Well, we can change that and we can broaden that training to you know, really be person-centered. That means having the time to have relationships with the people that you're caring for, uh, presumably the same people, not you know, 30 strangers each shift. Um, it means being as responsive to their individual personalities, likes, dislikes, needs, and so on, as it is to their need to you know, get up, to get um, a meal, to be toileted uh, and assisted in other ways. We can retrain staff and we can lift up that staff in the process if we want to. We haven't done it yet because there's a lot of racism <laughs> in the field as well uh, of nursing home, which unfortunately manifests in extremely low wages, uh, very scant, if any, benefits, no career path whatsoever um, upward generally. So if you're a CNA and you come in on that first rung of the ladder, somehow there's this expectation that you will remain at that level socioeconomically for 40 years or for a long time and, and, and be okay. Well, most people obviously don't really feel that way and they leave. Therefore, the turnover is more than 100% a year. So that means a complete change in staffing per year in a given average nursing home. We can change that. We can put those career pathways in place. We can do a better job training. We can track how much money really goes to direct care staff as opposed to perhaps other things uh, that investors might be interested in. So to make all this happen um, from a policy and political point of view, we have to know more about what is going on. We have to know who the owners are. Shockingly, we don't really know who many of the owners are. Uh, I know that's hard to believe, but it's really true. It's a very dynamic field and, you know, there are real estate investment trusts and all kinds of different players involved. That's fine conceptually, but they ought to be known, you know, um, to the federal government so that when things go wrong, we know who to talk to. We don't really know um, where all that money goes. And it's almost $200 billion a year that we spend on nursing homes. That's a lot of money, uh, but we don't really know where that Medicare dollar goes, how much of it is going to direct care, how much of it is going to capital improvements, what about the administrative costs, what are they and how much is going to those, and that sort of squishy category indirect costs, what are those? We are not tracking that uh, the way that we could and should. So if we did that, and we then looked over here at what the staffing is really looking like, is it adequate, is it not adequate? Um, and we look at those annual inspections and we look at the assessment um, uh, protocols that have clinical quality measures built into them, then we'll know who's doing a great job and who is not doing such a great job. That's pretty much condition number one for improving, I think, the baseline of who is an owner, who's an operator, who is mission driven, who is more interested in, in making a quick buck and siphoning off money for Wall Street because there's too much of that right now. So we need to fix that. And then to get to the transformation, um, once you sort of nudge some of those players that you don't really want in the sector over, you know, to go invest in something else perhaps, then you can really transform the field. You can do that training. You can, you know, create private rooms. Uh, I know that Deke is is, I don't know if you talked about this, but moving um, at least one of his nursing homes or maybe building a new wing to have private rooms. And that's called a household model. That's wonderful. People really do want that. They tell us that over and over. They don't really want roommates, many people in their 80s, 90s, and as um, you know, over 100 years old. Most people don't want a stranger as a roommate. So we can do that. And then we can set standards in place for having consistent staffing, adequate staffing, all kinds of wonderful quality metrics. We can basically tie the reimbursement under Medicare, Medicaid, and private pay to whether nursing homes achieve those things. Along the way, we will improve resident quality of life a lot. So can we actually do this? Can we get the attention of people on Capitol Hill? It's kind of an interesting Congress, the 118th Congress. I'm watching it pretty closely myself. We have a GOP majority in the House. We have a Democratic majority in the Senate. And there's going to be a lot of um, back and forth on some of these policy matters. They're complex. Um, some of them are you know, not uh, well understood. Um, and we need to keep our eye 
on that policy and really how good is it and challenge, uh, whether it's Ron Wyden, who's chair of the Senate Finance Committee or others to do the best possible job. I'll note that the Biden administration is interested in nursing homes. And you mentioned the upcoming um, Transformation Tuesday that will be on February 28th. That will be exactly one year uh, ago, uh, one year from when the president announced and the White House announced a whole raft of initiatives to improve nursing homes. And they're very much what we've been talking about uh, this hour. And we need to hold the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services accountable for delivering on those. They shouldn't just announce them and walk away. Uh, we have a wonderful National Academy of um, Medicine report uh, that's been mentioned a couple of times. It came out a few months after that February announcement uh, that the White House made. And that is now uh, the subject of an implementation initiative that Alice Bonner is heading, and I know she's on this call. And you can get involved with that if you so choose. And so can other people that you know. It's a, it's a kind of a movement, I think, that we're building. And the idea is to implement what's in that report, which is very similar to what the administration has announced. So I think if we do a lot of work, uh, we can explode the old assumptions. We can explode the sort of ageist attitude that older people you know, should be over there. Uh, they're not working, they're not productive. They have nothing to say, nothing to give. That's ridiculous, we all know that. But we have to say so, we have to be loud about it. And I know that Jack is, is really good at that. And uh, so are many of the people on this call. We can't be too shy, we have to be out there. Uh, we have to be doing many more events like this because ageism is still with us and it's going to be with us. But like any ism, it can be challenged, should be consistently and continually. And meanwhile, we can reshape um, the bad paradigms that we've inherited. Yes, we have inherited them. Yes, they are malleable. Yes, we can turn you know, the corner and make the money go for what we actually want. We just have to insist on it. All right, I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Alice, thanks for the concrete way forward. It's, it's kind of a pathway. How we achieve it, not yet sure, but you've offered specific areas in which ageism can be addressed in nursing homes, you know, to change, as you call it, change the paradigms. We all have a lot of work to do, everybody on this call. Most of the people on this call have attended other Transformation Tuesdays, so everybody is familiar with what we're doing here. Um, as we were, as I was listening to everybody, um, I had my own call to action here. One of the things that we at Great Panthers, and specifically, has been one of Michelle's um, dreams, is that the library of Great Panthers. Transformation Tuesdays be used as learning tools in, in, in either academic institutions or nonprofits or training sessions or whatever it may be. I would encourage anyone and or everyone on this call, uh, if they are aware of an institution or an op a learning opportunity where the stuff that we discuss here can be further addressed and uh, promoted, please get in touch with us. Could be a, a college, could be a, um, a training center, could be whatever it may be for any age. So uh, from here, I'd also like to ask people, what are your comments about what, have been, what we've been discussing here today? Because, you know, the people here who have been the, the, the speakers, they got a lot to say and a lot to think about, give you a lot to think about, but what else is there? What, let's, whoever it may be, would you raise your hand? I, I see Joan Davis. Joan, do you wanna speak for a moment? I guess you have to unmute yourself. Emily, can you unmute Joan? I can't do it. Um, All right. I see Karen Clink would like to speak. Karen, would you be so kind as to uh, offer a few uh, words? 
Uh, well, I, I, I pretty much put what I was, wanted to say in, in the chat. I, 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 there's, you know, uh, there's plenty of action, uh, you know, to take and there's plenty of action I have taken. Um, I've spoken up. I've taken action. Michelle, you know, knows. Um, I, 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 you know, the problem is if you're a daughter and an advocate, it's, it's a very difficult place to be um, because, um, you know, I advocate all over, I advocate all over the place, but when I try to advocate, you know, for my mom, you know, in, in, in a, in, in an area, like I, I am a troublemaker. I am a, um, complainer. I am a, um, I create problems. They, they come back to me with rules and regulations and threaten my visitation and have, have been able to do so. Um, I am, you know, there's re retaliation and retribution and intimidation and, you know, move your mom out, move your mom home, take care of her yourself. Um, all of these things have happened to me and I'm in five, four or five different places. So, um, you know, the families are not power and power of attorneys and um, resident reps are not treated in such a way where we have a voice and and if we don't have a voice and residents don't have a voice um they are treated the same way um the power and the money and all that stuff is stacked against us and um and the, and, and the facilities don't follow the rules and um karen what do you see as the solution or a solution what well i'll I, I i don't know because i've done everything and um and it doesn't matter and when i talk to an ombudsman they're supposed to be our representatives they are completely not they are on the on the wrong side and they also only work for the resident so so and let me give you an, an example like the the facilities will say your mom has rights to speak for herself, but only when it works right. in their favor, right? But if it works in my favor, like if my mom says I'm okay at this particular moment, then they I have to abide by that. But if my mom tells me that they're doing something or they're leaving her alone right. or they're not doing anything, then that then they they then they ignore my mother. Right. Like and this goes on every day. Karen, um I wanted to give some other people an opportunity to yeah, absolutely I'm done. Uh, Joan, you had a, something that you wanted to say? Yes, I do. Follow the money. I can't. I, I'm, I'm a. I'm long in the tooth myself. I live in, in an institute. I live in an assisted living facility, and I can't work this properly in order to get you you to hear me. If you could unmute we me, we can hear you. We can hear you. Can. Very good. I'm glad to hear it. Right so next to me, good. there was a lady walking around. She needs one-on-one -on -one care. And she doesn't get it here because it's not that kind of a place. And it's very difficult to advocate, but I'm interested and I want other people to be able to, you gotta follow, one, follow the money, and two, um, just keep at it. I, I, I love what, yes. wait, I, one more thing I would like to say. Eleanor said, Roosevelt said, Nothing has ever been achieved by the person who says it can't be done. Right. And I think we just have to stick to it, period, exclamation point, et cetera. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak and I'm glad this machine is working. Bye, thank Love you. you Love you, Joan. Um, Susan Friedman, I'm gonna ask you to say something because you put some stuff into the chat and I think that people should hear what your suggestions are. I hope it's not too loud for you. Susan? Governor Kathy Hochul officially wrapped up the legislative business of two dentists. Oops. I'm so happy to hear that. Susan, where are you? Well, Susan has suggested that the presenters could create some templates for letters that we can share with everyone on the call. Well, and I'll add to that, Michelle. Um, I was just reading the chat by, um, I think it was Carmen, who suggests that in addition to writing our local and federal politicians, we also write letters to CMS and DHS. Also, Anne Montgomery, um, thank you, Anne. You have offered to write a draft 
a mm -hmm. template for us that is so generous. Um, how do we go about following up with you on that? Absolutely. I know that Anne, it won't be an issue because I'll be on Anne's case. <laughs> uh, Ron, Ron Roll. Okay, you're on this call. You've been on a few of our Transformation Tuesdays. How can you help this movement develop? Well, personally, I have a, you know, a, a podcast called 45 Forward, you know, so, so that basically the, the theme of it is uh, make your second half of life even better than the first. And Jack has been on the podcast and a number of other people. I see uh, Carol Wallman who's on our call has been on the podcast from she's nearby. Um, the first thing I just wanted to say, Jack, is I really commend you for, for basically galvanizing this group and staying with it. So I, I listened to this, to everyone here, and there's just a, such an amazing wealth of information and knowledge and commitment. And part of me feels like, you know, when you say, what can you do? And I don't mean this as a diversion. It's sort of all of the above. People are working on this. I think it was Deke who said that there's a, there's a movement afoot. And I really feel that this is happening. Um, but, you know, for myself personally, I feel like, you know, not to be too grandiose, but I feel a little bit like listening to, you know, Mark, uh, you know, uh, Martin Luther King's speech of like, I might not get to the mountaintop, but I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep working as long as I can, as hard as I can, um, and with as many people as I can. So personally, I'm looking at, you know, at getting Jack back in the podcast and others, because to me, it's, it's, to me, the solution is recognizing that, you um, looking at, for me, the paradigm of, of, of aging is if you can design a system that is the best for the oldest and most vulnerable, then, then you can design a system for everybody. That They're the ones who you should use as your model for, for caring. Um, that is often the case. That kind of is the, the underlying premise of universal design. Right. And, and yes. I think... And, and I, th I do think that the pandemic has, you know, uncovered some serious flaws in the system. Um, but people are on, uh, who are on this call are the people who are going to really work on this problem. And one, one you, of the you, things that we have noted throughout is that everybody's a talking head. How do we convert that into action and long term change? That's really the difficult, and that's my own personal bugaboo. I'm really good at the ideas, not so good on the follow through. Excuse me. I'm, this is Elizabeth Grace. Yes, ma'am. I am challenged with this new technology because I'm. You ain't my... the only one. <laughs> <laughs> this is my first time um, coming to this chat room. And I am amazed at how wonderful everything, the speaking has been great. I will just pass on a little information or a little uh, experience that I had. <clears throat> Excuse me. My mom was in a nursing home. Um, she was teetering be uh, about dementia. And we had the first uh, meeting, staff meeting there. And my husband and I walked in and we saw the speech therapist and everybody, physical therapists, nurses, administration. And I looked around the room and I did not see the CNA that took care of my mother. So I asked, why was that person not there? It's not a policy that they come. Um, and I said, I would appreciate it if that person would be available during these conferences. Uh, well, we just don't do that. And I said, thank you very much. My husband and I got up and started to walk out. Well, this is mandated. So they said, well, okay. I said, the CNA is the person who takes the best and the most care of my mother. She can tell me more than the nurse who sits at the station. And I happen to be a registered nurse, so I know this. From that time on, my mom was a resident for three years, 
We always had an aide. And my mom got excellent care because we were in and out of that facility. All because you were on their case all the time. <laughs> and that's what I advocate. So and what, what, you're saying, what you're saying is that everybody needs an advocate. That is what absolutely, you're absolutely. And don't back down. And whoever said the you know follow the money is right because they are uh, they work for you. You don't work for them. Right. So they, they work for you. Thank you. I will I, definitely I'm, Jack Marjorie would like to say yes. something. Marjorie, I'm, sorry, Marjorie. I'm sorry, didn't see that. Marjorie. That's okay. I am from Illinois and I work with the Illinois Department of Aging and I also work with State Center Karina Villa. Last year we got a bill passed in Springfield uh, ensuring more rights for seniors in long-term care and nursing home. It took us two years because the National Health Council came after us. Yes. What do you mean they can get water when they need it or have bathroom privileges? And we were just overwhelmed by the fact that they came after it, but we got the bill passed. Good for you. And also, I have done a podcast about my experience. I am out of facility. I am independent, well, and very active. But since then, I have been getting videos. People are putting nanny cams in the nursing homes from Ireland, from Australia, and from the United States. And I cannot watch them before bed because the horrors of these people yelling for help, wondering whatever have I done to be taken care of this way. Wow. Uh, what I was thinking is an action thing. Can these CNAs somehow have classes in responsiveness and compassion? You know, just a time for them to learn how to be responsive for people because nursing homes so much are on efficiency. You know, I got the chart done on this person without the quality, without being responsive to people, without just a sense of care or even a half a smile. And that's what these video shows plop down the tray and out of the room and no one said good morning or hello. And I don't know, people speak of it so often. How can we change that culture of retribution? When I was in a nursing home 13 years ago, recovering from surgery, I spoke out and they put me in a mental institution that the psychiatrist asked me, what did you bring up in the nursing home? These are trumped up charges and we'll get you out as soon as we can. And it goes from that kind of thing to, you can speak up and then ask for a bottle of water. And if you're bedridden, the bottle of water's on the other side of the room and they mark it off on the chart that you've been given water. So I don't know how that can be changed, but I thought maybe teaching these people when they take the class, a little more responsiveness, a little more compassion. God bless you, Marjorie. Thank you. Um, and Jack, Jack, just well, very quickly. One more, per sorry, go ahead. Just, I'm sorry, just, I want to very quickly say, if people missed this in the chat, this is an incredible opportunity. We have had a Imad Ansari on here, who re is the works in the office of Stephanie Zimmerman, who is a um, assembly member. And in, Imad has said that she's very committed to changing um, situations in nursing homes. If you guys could all go to that chat and copy and paste the email, that's somebody that said he would like to help us on a government policy level. Great. Um, and Imad, could you also reach out to us um, individually so that we can forge our alliances with you? Sure. Thank you. If you can tell me who to reach out to, I can do that. Uh, you could do it, um, Jack at graypanthersnyc.org and Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E -L -L -E, at graypanthersnyc.org. Thank you. 
Uh, Jack, we just have, we have two more people who have their hands raised. So I just want to make sure. Hey, who are they? Clifton Perez. Clifton, let's start with you. Hi, my name is Clifton Perez. I, uh, I've been advocating for people. You can hear me, right? Yes. Yep. I've been advocating for the rights of people with disabilities for over 37 years. And actually, by the way, this is the first group I, I'm in that I think I'm actually one of the youngest people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty awesome for me. Um, <laughs> but um, I have written in the chat that part of the problem, and I, and I say part because there's, there's a lot more to this, but part of the problem is this country has an institutional bias. So it, because of that, everything is referred to as institutions and people attract to institutions and especially people with disabilities. This is where people with disabilities and the aging population, as I had written in, in the chat, I'm intersected that, that now with my disability that I've had since I was born and now that I'm older. And so, but I've been seeing this all along, it's just now it's affected anymore. But we need to get rid of this institutional bias in this country. That's gonna help a lot in this problem that we've been talking about a lot when people are given a real option, a real choice about whether or not to go into an institution or actually truly being able to live at home in their own community with all the care that they need, which is very possible. And that's the very thing that we people with disabilities are fighting for very, very vigorously on this issue about getting rid of the institutional bias of this country. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and who is the next person? Because I don't- uh, Gilbert. Gilbert? You and me. I, Jack, I, I think that part of the problem we have is the way we treat the people who are the most important nursing homes, which are the CNAs. Mm -hmm. I remember 20 years ago when nursing homes are generally properly staffed, where the connection between the CNA and the resident was a bond. And if you ask the resident who is the most important person for you, they wouldn't say my daughter or, or, or my son or uh, -uh. they said my CNA. It, it was it was a real, real bond because they had the time to be a person to the resident. Nowadays, with the kind of staffing that we have, they have no time to do that. If you have 17 people to take care of in a seven hour shift because you don't work eight hours, you work seven hours, it's impossible to be humane and treat people like that because you have to give, uh, have to change this one, have to feed the other one, you have to go and give water to the other one. There's just no time. And, and I've been so involved advocating for the CNAs that they be treated with respect from the administration to begin with and to be properly staffed so they can have time to really, really provide love to the residents. Thank uh, you. On, on that note, what you, your last words, something as you were speaking, Gilbert, made me think that this is a perfect note to close on. You were just referencing the love that the CNAs have for their, the people that they're charged with caring for, and it works both ways. And so much we hear it over and over and over again how staff at nursing homes love the residents and how the residents love the staff members. It's just that the whole system is a piece of crap. And, you know, based on ageism, and it's like, okay, fine, everybody's disposable. We in this room have the opportunity to smack the hell out of everybody and make some uh, real good changes. I'm hoping that we will be able to do that. Um, everybody is welcome to email us, to work with us. Uh, Michelle has put in her email address into the chat. We will be sending out the, um, the recording as well as the chat. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody for coming out today always a blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. They Thank appreciate you. Right. Have a nice day. Very much. Take care, everyone.
Steve on February 28th, everybody, at the next meeting. Uh, thank you. Bye, thank you. Nice presentation. All right.